I'm Richard Shepard, S-H-E-P-A-R-D. Okay, and now why don't you tell us a little bit about how you came to the Manhattan, come into the Manhattan Project and how that happened. And I graduated from high school about three or four weeks after I was 17 in 1943. I had been an amateur radio guy, uh, having been licensed with, in 1941 with a station I built myself from money made with paper route money, and uh, heard that Auburn University in Birmingham, Auburn of course being in Auburn, Alabama, but they had an extension center in Birmingham that had a night school thing, and I went to that when I was in high school. And uh, uh, when I graduated, I started to the University of Alabama, and then within about two weeks got a letter from the Army and Navy saying you can be an ASTP or V-12. Uh, ASTRP was reserved until you were 18. I couldn't pass the Navy physical, but I did pass the Army one by drinking a lot of milk and eating enough bananas to weigh 126 pounds uh, at five feet 10 and a half. And so that, that was six weeks in the, in the summer term of the University of Alabama and I was left and in the Army went to NC State in engineering until I was 18 and then was in the infantry. Uh, basic training at Camp Wheeler, Georgia. At the end of basic training, or near the end of it, I got a letter after being interviewed by the camp board saying I was uh, going to go to infantry OCS. The next day I got another set of, the first one was a letter, the second one was a set of orders that sent me to Penn State instead in the ASTP for six months, and I finished that in the uh, uh, late winter or early spring of 1945 and then was sent here. My roommate was sent to Los Alamos. Uh, here, uh, when we were waiting to be cleared by the FBI, I didn't know what was going on. I went to the commanding officer, I believe Captain Barger, and asked to be put back in the infantry because I had bonded with these guys and knew by that time, I thought pretty surely that uh, because of things that were written in the infantry journal that uh, they, a good many of them had been hurt or killed in the Battle of the Bulge and you're really bonded to these people. But it, he said, you're here, you can't go anywhere else. And I got assigned to K-25 with a nice bunch of guys and I uh, worked on the line recorders, which were the mass spectrometers we mentioned a few minutes ago. Uh, when the war ended, I stayed here, and then the, the uh, bikini test uh, planning was announced, and the people here asked for people who were willing to go to sign up. I did. Uh, we went to the Oakland Army base. Uh, I was with several people who went down to San Diego and put instruments on a destroyer squadron, the Laffey, Lowry, Moe, Lowry, Moe, Ingraham, and Sumner and were some of the destroyers to measure radiation underwater on the surface and in the air. Then went back to uh, the Oakland Army base and we went to uh, Bikini on the ship Haven, H-A-V-E-N, which was a converted, it wasn't converted, it was a hospital ship, a wonderful ship. It was probably the only air-conditioned ship that there was out there, I suppose. Uh, there I worked in the instrument group with a fellow named Don Collins who had been in the SED in New York, who had been discharged and was now an engineer, the manager in Bikini for the Victorine Instrument Company that made the instruments. So I worked in, in his group there and as a radiation monitor for the uh, Baker test, I was on a destroyer, the Laffey, which has a, a distinguished wartime history. Ch we chased the cloud. Those guys on that destroyer were so glad to see somebody who had been associated in any way with the atomic bomb because they had been so clobbered. 
that I was an enlisted man then, a staff sergeant, a T3, I guess it was, and uh, they put a chair, you know, this was after the war, so they could have movies on the deck at night when nothing else was happening. They put a chair in the front and hung a sign on it reserved for the U.S. Army, and that was me. <laughs> so they, you can see it, just how glad they were that that war had been stopped. Uh, for the second test, I was on a little PGM, which was a small, very small Navy seagoing ship. And we went in right after the underwater burst to measure the radiation. There's a book, Operation Crossroads, published by the Naval Institute Press that, that mentions that in a paragraph. It just says that people were sent in 41 minutes after the bomb went off. That was a very interesting day. We, uh, my instruments were really reading off scale just about all the time. We had an ionization chamber and various two kinds of Geiger counters, as I remember. Uh, we got rained on, uh, saw the Saratoga from a reasonable distance uh, settling down to sink. And then we were all taken, went off that ship at night. I don't know where the regular crew went. The navigator on it was a fellow named Don Wasson, who I had known sort of peripherally in high school. And this was his first uh, trip on a ship like that as a navigator, and he was so glad to have even gotten to Bikini, I think, as a navigator. But I don't know where they went, but we went back to the Haven, and there I, we worked in the monitoring of the various ships. The beautiful Prince Oregon, been on board that. Uh, Mm -hmm. This is a great story, um, but you want to know back to the Manhattan Project. That's going to be the focus of mm -hmm. what I'm trying to do right now. Mm -hmm. I, but I um, sure mm -hmm. okay. So can you talk about the uh, K25 and the remember that we're going to my voice will not be part of this. You know, no one's going to hear anything I say. It's just so what you have to do is make sure um, to talk about whatever without reference to you know. The question you asked a while ago. In other words, we have to make sure that everybody can, everybody can understand what okay. you know, so, said. So let's talk about the line monitors, if you would, um, what they were, explain, explain what the K-25 did and, and why you mm -hmm. need, okay? Uh, K-25, as I'm sure anybody watching this probably knows, was a monstrously large plant that separated uranium hexafluoride gas into he uranium hexafluoride with the 235 and 238 isotopes. The separation was made by diffusion through barriers. There was only a small gain in concentration of the desired isotope with each barrier, so the uh, concentration was measured at various stages along the way. And also, the place had to be leak-proof. Uranium hexafluoride is a toxic gas. It's gas when it's heated. Uh, it's not a gas at ordinary temperatures or slightly lower than ordinary temperatures. At any rate, there, uh, these, these little spectrometers uh, w were uh, the spectrometer itself. They had to be in a, the the ionized gases that were in the plant stream had to uh, uh, be go through the electromagnetic field of the mass spectrometer in a very high vacuum. The vacuum was maintained by diffusion pumps and a four pump, a diffusion pump with each device and a four pump that, that lowered the, the uh, pressure the diffusion pump worked into. Uh, the uh, instrumentation associated with the with these mass spectrometer stations, called line recorder stations, was a bank of uh, recording devices. Uh, they would print dots on a piece of paper, a roll of paper about 12 inches wide. These were made by the Leeds and Northrop Company, as I recall. The uh, these. These mass spectrometer stations were scattered in the plant stream. Uh, the people who worked with them 
had bicycles, so we would ride on bicycles to where we were going. Uh, the, the each station was run by there was an operator in the station. They were usually young young women or young ladies, uh, mostly from this part of the country, I think. Uh, the the supervisor of my group was a man named Poole, P W O L E, who was a civilian. Uh, he was a, a pleasant guy who didn't react to being called cesspool by everybody who knew him there at work, so that was sort of fun. <laughs> and the other guys were really, really, they were all uh, people who would be called sharp people, and they were fun, so that was very fun. We were young enough so that rotate, working a uh, rotating shift didn't bother us at all. Uh, you'd get on the bus. At first, we were in barracks. It was just a, a long Quonset hut with cots, and later on moved into uh, dormitories. And from either the barracks or the dormitory, we would get on the bus and go down to K-25 and work and then come back, except that occasionally there would be a dance after the 11 o'clock shift, so that was very interesting to, and fun to go to. That's about what I would have to say about that, except the whole place was, all the people in the SED that I knew were, were just very interesting people and fun to be with, that's what it amounts to. All kinds of people, all kinds of characters and different uh, sort of personality characteristics that go with, with the kind of jobs they were doing or we were doing, I suppose. But all in all, it was, uh, although I was very much bonded to the people I'd been with in the infantry, that was, uh, I guess you would say, a little bit grimmer, and this was much more fun. That's about it. Okay. Um, <coughs> so, um, tell us about, can you describe being on a bicycle and, and what did it feel like to be going by these, going down these long alleyways? If you were kind of to putting yourself back in that, what was it like? Were these big fat tire bicycles with baskets or, you know, can you describe the bicycles and what you carried in them or how far you went? Well, the uh, part of K-25 I was in was the third floor. As you face the U from the top of the U, uh, looking down on the plant from above, uh, everything I did was on the right side. I didn't go on the left side. so. I don't recall anything about the bicycles except they were handy. And uh, there was a little office that, that we had that was about halfway up the U from the top down towards what in a normal U would be considered the bottom. I do remember there were some jokes. Uh, we ha used liquid nitrogen as part of the uh, methods of working with the, with the pumps. And uh, I remember one guy, when I was sitting at the desk in the little office, a guy poured some liquid nitrogen in the back of my shoe, which really made me jump. But right now, most of the things we worked with, uh, you would uh, uh, get in trouble with the government for handling the way we handled then. Uh, you certainly couldn't pour liquid nitrogen in somebody's shoe and trichloroethylene, which we mixed with dry ice as a coolant uh, would require more stringent uh, controls to use the way we did, and I suppose that uh, mercury would require more controls too, although we had very little exposure to that. But what happens when you put liquid nitrogen in your shoe? It tends to freeze the bottom of your back of your heel unless you get it off right quick, which is not hard to do. Did you know what it was on your heel? Or? Mm -mm. It's like somebody does something to you that feels very different very rapidly and you just respond by reaching down and yanking off your shoe. <laughs> so then did you 
sho- throw your shoe at him? Did you know who did this? I think it was a guy named Bob Bryant, but I may be wrong. Uh, there was another fellow there who was, Bryant was a fairly big guy, and I don't know what happened to him. There was another uh, fellow who was about a foot or a foot and a half shorter, whose name I can't recall, who may have been the guy who did it, but I'm not sure. There are a lot of uh, specifics that have faded from memory. My memories of Bikini are much more vivid in some ways than those here. Mm-hmm. Um, what, were the, what were the dormitories like? You said first you lived in a Quonset hut? Yeah. Well, the Quonset huts, you could, you know, with rotating shifts, there was always somebody asleep and always somebody getting up. So the Quonset huts were very interesting. And when you were as young as we were, you didn't mind all of that. The, the dormitories were were uh, nicer. I had a roommate who's still my friend, a fellow named Bill Tyson, who had worked with uranium chemistry at Columbia. He had a chemical engineering degree from Purdue. And uh, uh, he was a great roommate. And uh, once we had a three-day pass and went on a hike in the Smoky Mountains up the Appalachian Trail in the middle of December uh, with another friend who was a naval aviator, and uh, Bill and I, several years after we got out of the Army, went on a canoe trip in the uh, uh, so-called boundary waters of northern Minnesota, which is very interesting. So he's been a lifelong friend, although we don't see each other very much. He lives out of San Francisco now. Um, there was a uh, cafeteria adjacent to the dormitory we went in, uh, we had a, uh, I think the meal allowance was a dollar and 65 cents a day, something like that. I may have the figure wrong, but the food was fine from my point of view, although I'm sure from a lot of people's it wouldn't be. I mentioned being in the infantry and having to drink milk and eat bananas to weigh 126. When I got through basic training, I weighed 140 six, I believe, and uh, you, at that age when you were active, you would eat anything that was eatable, and uh, from my point of view, the food here was very good, although I'm not aware of any specifics now. Now, did you, you say the dances were fun, did you, were you a bachelor at this time? Yeah, certainly, I mean, very much of actually I was by the time I got here I was I was still 18 when I got here and uh, I was 19 most of the time I was here I made friends with a girl and and uh, went and spent a weekend uh, with her and her family in Nashville and uh, um, but that didn't lead to anything serious When you talk about the ships, there were three ships, twenty-four yes, hours, uh-huh. all, all the, the entire war period. The entire time I was working there, I don't know about before and after. There were seven to three, three to eleven, and eleven to seven. Mm-hmm. My roommate w- worked in uh, uh, some sort of control facility for the plant. We never talked about our individual jobs. I guess we were both pretty curious people, but we just didn't do it and didn't give it much thought to discuss what each one of us were doing, uh, was doing. Did, what did you think you were doing? Did you have any idea what this was about? Yes. Uh, during the orientation, the, the, in a little building in the middle of the U, there was a uh, man giving a talk to a small group of us who who said, read this chapter in this modern physics book, and we did, and the chapter was about the packing fraction. And uh, about getting the energy by fission from uranium. So we were aware that we were involved with that, but uh, 
did not pursue it any further, at least with anybody else. And uh, I think that people in general uh, would probably, uh, if you think of a normal probability curve, the one end of the curve is going to be very questioning about anything at all. But uh, if you're full of activities, most of the people in the probability curve will sort of accept what things are like and just work on it. That's very much true in uh, medicine. And I'm an emeritus professor of surgery now, and, uh, and people accept that medicines work or medicines have side effects, but, but very few people are so inquisitive that they can, that they get to the bottom of every thing that they're concerned with. And in fact, in real life, you can't because you have to pick one particular thing and become an expert in it if you're going to be an expert at something. Or maybe some extraordinary people can be very expert at several things, but not many. What about you? So what about, uh, no, that's well, well put. Uh, what about, um, what did it feel like when they announced that the war was over? It was very good. It was a big celebration. I was working, and a guy came along on a bicycle with a, handing out little pieces of paper that said, part of the biggest secret of the war is known. And there were words to the effect, I don't remember the exact wording, that we trust you will not talk about what you are doing. So, you know, there was a sort of a party outside the plant, I think. This was, I forget whether, which shift it was, but I know when I went out, there were a lot of people having a good time. There's a famous picture with Ed West that Ed Westcott took of, you know, war over that mm -hmm. everybody's holding the newspapers. Was mm -hmm. that, do you remember that scene? Or can you? I don't. Uh, I just remember being very happy, that's all. Uh, Have you had any questions? I think, I think that that my attitude toward the war was a little different from the people who had never been in, uh, in an outfit that was really going to fight people. You know, if you were a civilian working in a civilian job or, or an engineer who was drafted and was sent directly here without having been through some kind of serious military outfit training, uh, you didn't feel the war in quite the same personal sense that you would, uh, for example, the uh, commanding, one of the company commanders where I was had uh, been through Africa and Italy, and of all his people, only three got through it intact, you know. So that meant that that, that man who we respected very much uh, was going to be pretty tough on people, and really, uh, uh, it was his attitude that he didn't mind, not that he did, but he didn't mind having a few people die during basic training uh, because it would save more lives later. And we could understand that and respected it. And it made one feel uh, different about the war. In addition, I had uh, seven male first cousins of military age. One was 4F, all the rest were in service. One was a Naval Academy graduate who got a Navy Cross. Another was an MIT graduate who uh, flew a Thunderbolt uh, fighter airplane and was killed six days after D-Day over the French coast region. And uh, two were doctors. One was in the Army and was on a ship that was sunk in the Pacific but survived. Another was a doctor on a destroyer. And uh, one was a VMI graduate who was an artillery spotter in uh, France and later in Korea. Uh, one was in the Air Force in, Eng in England. So I had a personal investment in having the war over. In fact, they would have considered me a slacker, I suppose, you know, working in a job where you could come out and go to a dance. <laughs> 
Did they? Ever, did you ever talk about it with them? Did they? No, really. Uh, uh, each of us would uh, since I was only had some stripes on my sleeve without bars at that time once when I saw my first cousin who was a doctor and I only saw him once uh, when he was in the army and I was still in I wondered whether or not to salute him and he thought he would have thought that was ridiculous you know <laughs> doctors are very unmilitary you know as a I spent 10 years becoming a surgeon after I got my physics degree at Penn State and went to med school at Penn and uh, and during the uh, Vietnam War a lot of the residents we were training went off in service but the the uh, doctors in general are, are doctors and not military people which is good but it also means that they may seem a little strange sometimes in their reaction to military things that's neither here nor there from your point of view now I guess I think some of the People here would have seemed strange from that point of view to, to GIs, you know, too. One Yank cartoon sticks in my mind. It's in a big, long procession of, of uh, American infantry and, and uh, trucks and tanks going up some mountain in Italy and right in, at the very apex of this procession going up this long mountain road was a guy called Sad Sack who was famous during the war as a he was made by a cartoonist. And Sad Sack was in front of this long line of armor with a mine detector walking up the road. You know, that was the infantry that, that sort of bore the real burden. And our guys are doing that now, too, in Iraq. They, uh, uh, well, one kind of last question, because uh, I know you have to get going. Uh, if you could just talk about what do you think about the importance of preserving this history for future generations? I think that preserving the history is, is important in at least two senses. One is that a certain percentage of the population is naturally curious about what happened in the past. The other reason is that, that we learn some things about how to behave in the present from the result of how we behaved in the past. So uh, then my wife is an example of a naturally curious person about history. She, she had a Fulbright in history and has a uh, PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. So our house is full of history books and it's full of technical engineering and physics books and uh, medical books and journals. And my wife has come in, if we get any more books, we'll have to move out, you know. So, so I think you're doing a good, a great thing to have this foundation and preserve history. <laughs>